I was asked to talk about three things, about the Marketplace Fairness Act, the Internet Sales Tax Mandate, about my political journey, and maybe some stories about the TSA that I would like to share with you guys. Since I just flew in last night and it's fresh on my mind, I thought that I'd start with the TSA. But actually, I, I gotta take the high road here, don't I? And, uh, well, those guys, the TSA is such low-hanging fruit. I mean, anybody could bash the TSA. I could tell you about the time that I was coming back from Australia and I had a layover in Los Angeles Airport. I, in, in Australia, I had bought a balsa wood toy boomerang as a souvenir. Well, as I'm going back through security at LAX, I was informed that I could not bring my balsa wood toy boomerang on the airplane because it was a weapon. <laughs> All right, so let me get this straight. You mean to tell me that they sell weapons in the Melbourne, Australia airport? And, and how about all the dangerous things that I can take on an airplane, like my four or five pound laptop, which would make a really good club, or my ink pen, which would make a very good stiletto. And uh, by the way, if very soon the TSA bans either laptops or ink pens, sorry about that, but at least you know they were paying attention to LPAC. <laughs> I could talk about the time that I tried to give a TSA agent a pocket constitution from the Young Americans for Liberty. He had to ask for permission from his supervisor to accept it, in spite of the fact that as a federal agent, he is sworn to uphold the thing. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's pretty good in here. They always tell you to start your speech with a joke, and the idea that the TSA upholds the constitution, that's the best joke I could possibly do, right? <laughs> Or I could talk about the time that the TSA shut down an airport that I was in as I was flying home and made everyone evacuate out of the terminal because they had found a suspicious package. So we waited outside for an hour and a half, missing our flights, only to learn that the TSA had run a drill the night before and someone had forgotten to remove the suspicious package. <laughs> it was the TSA's own suspicious package. Now I could talk about all that stuff, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna talk about myself. More accurately, how I came to be where I am at politically. Not that long ago, I had a meeting with a state senator in my home state of Tennessee, and he asked me, how did a guy like you get interested in this stuff? And he didn't really say it like that, and he didn't mean it derisively. But what he was referring to is the fact that most people aren't interested in economics and finance. And we generally only take a cursory interest in politics. I would like to state for the record that I am not interested in politics. I actually hate politics. Yeah. It's just the fact that the politicians have such an interest in me. <laughs> or taking my money. Or separating me from my freedoms. You see, there is nothing noble about politics. It's mean and it's dirty. Politics just means being able to seize power so you can make other people do what you want them to do. So you can be able to push other people around. Now that's not what I was taught in high school. In high school I learned that the government is this warm and fuzzy institution. It's the ultimate form of communalism. We all come together and we agree on solutions and then we go out and we make the world a better place. Together. What I never thought to do is what Mr. Salatin was referring to before was to raise my hand and say what if I think your solutions stink? Do I have the right to not participate? Do I have the right to not say no? During the 2008 presidential campaign, I saw some sign waivers for Hillary Clinton at one of the malls near Knoxville, where I live. I didn't have any place to go for a while, so I thought I'd go over and talk with them and ask them why they liked Hillary. So I approached the first one that I saw, which was an elderly gentleman, and, and I uh, asked him 
why do you like Hillary? And he told me that I would have to speak with their group leader, which I found rather interesting because if I ask anyone in this room about their opinion about politics or politicians, I will spend the next hour and a half wondering why in the world did I ever ask that question? <laughs> So I find the group leader, who was a young lady, and I ask her the same question. Why do you like Hillary? And she tells me, because Hillary is for health care and education. Like, okay, well, those are really good things. And I'm for health care and education too. But if I choose not to participate in your health care program, your socialized medicine, and she corrected me and said, universal health care. I said, okay, if I choose not to participate in your socialized medicine, or if I choose not to send my kids to government schools, men with guns will come and force me to participate, or they will take my stuff, or they will throw me in jail. They may even claim the authority to kill me. Oops. And she throws her hands up, and she takes two steps back, and she says, who said anything about guns? I was like, well, you did, of course. But she didn't get it. And I didn't get it for a long time. I never developed a political philosophy when I was younger because I didn't know that such a thing existed. I just thought that the government was supposed to do certain things because that was the right thing to do. And most of those things, of course, were based on my own personal values and preferences. At various times in my life, I thought that I was a liberal or that I was a conservative. So I would read things from both sides. But there were a couple facts that I could never get over. First of all, I hate taxes. And I always felt that the government was A, just wasting my money that I paid through taxes outright, or B, that they were giving my money to people who didn't deserve it. And I also couldn't get over the fact that I felt like if your actions weren't harming anyone else, you should be left alone. What's wrong with that? Yeah. Now, um, now, back to the tax thing for a second. I'm an independent contractor. And what that means is that I am not subject to withholding taxes. So every quarter, that is once every three months, I get to write a check out by hand to the Internal Revenue Service. Now, it is my opinion that if we could do just one thing to show people how badly big government hurts them, it would be to repeal the current Tax Payment Act of 1943, which reintroduced withholding taxes. If we actually made people write a check to the IRS, the 16th Amendment would be repealed in short order. <laughs> Instead, unfortunately, most of us have been fooled into thinking that when we get a refund check from the IRS, hey, they're doing me a favor. It's free money, yay! Except it was mine and money to begin with. But anyway. So one day at work, I was talking to a friend of mine about this stuff, and he said, you sound like a libertarian. And man, I got really mad. I was like, what do you want to fight? Why are you calling me names, huh? Call me a libertarian, whatever that is. So, so he went on to explain to me about the Nolan chart and about how we shouldn't look at politics as being left versus right, but how we should look at it as being individual liberty against authoritarianism. And he also told me to check out the Libertarian Party. So I went, so I went to the LP website, and I liked their platform a lot more than I did the Republican or Democratic platforms, of course. But I didn't understand that whole thing about you shouldn't use force to achieve political objectives. I thought that they were just talking about war. I didn't realize that they were talking about the entire concept of government because government is based on violence since it is an institution which claims the legal right and authority to coerce peaceful individuals. I was what I now call an ad hoc libertarian. I agreed with libertarians on most of the issues, so I thought that, hey, 
I'm a libertarian. But I'm one of those people that once I take an interest in something, I have to know everything about it. My wife says that I have obsessive compulsive disorder and it's a personality defect that explains a lot about me. But in any case, I started reading everything I could. I put down Michael Moore and Bill O'Reilly, the left and right of things, and I picked up John Stossel and Ayn Rand and F.A. Hayek yeah. and Andrew P. Napolitano. Yeah. And along the way, I heard about this crazy congressman from Texas who kept on saying stuff that I believe and actually voted like it too. And then I discovered a guy named Murray Rothbard. Now we often hear with libertarians that it all starts with Rothbard. With me, it all ended with Rothbard. His arguments were so logical and so faultless that I could not disagree with what he was saying. For the first time, I understood what the axiom of non-aggression meant. I understood that libertarianism is not about a political party, it's a philosophy. And what sets libertarians apart from the left and the right, in my opinion anyway, is the fact that their only philosophy is gaining and keeping political power. Well, along the way, I kept on hearing this term, Austrian economics. What is Austrian economics? I hated, hated economics when I was in school because I was not into math. But if people like Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul are talking about Austrian economics, it's probably pretty important and I should probably go try to learn something about it. So I did, and what I did absolutely shocked me. You see, I didn't even know that there were different schools of economics. For those of you, I'm sorry, um, it's actually true, and I say this, but it's true. Austrian economics literally changed my life because it changed the way that I look at the world. For me now, everything is about economics because everything is about economics. And for those of you who are not familiar with Austrian economics, Austrian economics is the study of purposeful human action. Austrian economists do not study things like models or mathematical equations or computer formula. They study people. And the thing about people is that people have free will. Therefore, you cannot predict what people are going to do. So economics should be looked at not as a predictive or proscriptive science, which I believe is much of the reason that we are in the economic situation that we are in because these central planners have the arrogance and hubris to believe that they can actually predict what human beings are going to do, which they can't. But in any case, economics is a descriptive science. It helps tell us what's going on and helps us to understand what's going on but we should make no assumptions that we can predict what is going to happen. Well, unfortunately, my discovery of libertarianism and Austrian economics has often led me to feel as, I have, as if I have taken the red pill from the matrix. Yeah, you guys, you guys get it, right? You're the same way, yeah. 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 You see, I've looked down the rabbit hole. I've gone down in the rabbit hole, and it goes a long, long, long way down. And I've spent a lot of time now trying to hack that pill back up because it's very uncomfortable when you find out, when you learn that everything that you thought and everything that you have been taught about our social systems is a lie. And And in fact, I believe that there are, that's why there are not more people like us, because it's very uncomfortable to come to that conclusion. So I spent a lot of time trying to hack that red pill back up, but 
once you see something, once you hear something, or once you learn something, it is impossible to unsee it, to unhear it, or to unlearn it. Yeah. So instead, now I spend all my time banging against the wall. You were joking, we were joking in the back, and a couple of people have talked about uh, announcing for Senate because Congressman Brown just did, and of course we had Rand Paul up here, but I, I'm not going to do that, so uh, don't worry. Uh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I like, I like hanging out places like this way too much. <laughs> so what I try to do now is, is I try to show people or to help people understand at least that there is a red pill that they may have an alternative that they have never considered before. And I'm not gonna lie, very often this has felt like an incredibly quixotic endeavor. But lately I have found that more and more people are being attracted to the message of liberty. Yeah. And this is especially true if we package that message in a form which is pal palatable to them. So what I try to do is, is I try to start by concentrating on an area in which I know people are going to agree with me. Taxes are that area because no one likes taxes. Well, except for the politicians who really love taxes. But the average sane person does not like taxes. So what I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of work with this so-called internet sales tax mandate, the Marketplace Fairness Act. And I'd like to thank Campaign for Liberty because they have been very helpful and giving me a lot of exposure and promoting my work in this area. And I would like to spend the time that I have remaining talking about the internet sales tax. First of all, I owe you all you an apology because I am from Tennessee, and unfortunately it seems that Tennessee is behind a lot of the impetus for the Marketplace Fairness Act. As many of you may know, I recently challenged the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Tennessee to debate me over the subject of the Marketplace Fairness Act, a challenge which, by the way, remains unanswered and is still open. But it's not just him, the governor's behind it. Our state senators are behind it. They're twisting arms at a local level, at a state level, to try to get it passed. Even the report which everybody quotes about how much revenue an internet sales tax will generate for the states was produced by an economist from the University of Tennessee. So why is it that all these officials from Tennessee are behind pushing the Marketplace Fairness Act? Well, it couldn't be because in Tennessee we have the highest sales tax rate in the nation, could it? And see, that's exactly what it is about. I'm thankful, and I don't praise politicians very much. Anybody who knows me knows that. But I am thankful that in Tennessee we have a pretty low tax burden, thanks to the legislature. They have done, they have done a very good job in this area. We have no state income tax, and our property taxes are relatively low compared to the rest of the country. But boy, oh boy, do we have a sales tax. Sales tax in Tennessee across the state averages 9.75%. So these guys in Tennessee, what they're thinking is that we're gonna make all of this money off the internet sales tax. It is going to be a windfall. Well, what they fail to take into account is what I was just talking about with Austrian economics and human action. If you raise taxes on a good, the price of the good goes up. If the price of a good goes up, people tend to buy less of that good. Now, that's not even Austrian economics, that's just mainstream common sense. So they're predicting, the University of Tennessee report is predicting that Tennessee will get $700 million a month. I'm sorry, a year, a month. Ooh. Ah, oh, the way the Fed's going, they'll probably get that eventually. But <laughs> they'll get $700 million a month off of an internet sales tax. And they're not going to get anything like that. This is, the internet sales tax is a new tax. The reason all these politicians just 
scream that it's not a new sales tax and not a new tax. In fact, that's why I challenged the lieutenant governor to obey to a debate because that's what he was saying. But the reason that they say it's not a new tax is because all of them have taken the pledge from the Americans for tax reform to not raise taxes, and now they're doing it. So they're just plain semantics. What they're saying is that, well, this money is already due, due the state because of use taxes. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with what a use tax is, a use tax is a complementary tax to a sales tax. And the way it works is like this. If you go to another state and buy a good, but you do not pay sales tax on that good in that state, and then you bring it back to your home state and you consume it or you use it in your home state, then you are supposed to remit a tax, a use tax, to your home state, which is generally the equivalent of a sales tax. Well, it's pretty obvious that sales taxes and use taxes, though related, they're two different things. A sales tax is collected and paid by the retailer. A use tax is paid by the consumer. So these guys can yell all they want that this is not a new tax, but it is a new tax, and all they are doing is reinforcing what the American people already know, that politicians talk out of both sides of their mouth while they fleece their wallets. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, physical retailers that are out there thinking that this internet sales tax is going to benefit them because it's going to benefit it's going to level the playing field. When we look at a government program, what we should always think about is not how the program is marketed and not who they say it is going to target, but how this program will expand and how it will end up affecting us. There was a case in 2009 in Massachusetts that went to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. The Department of Revenue in Massachusetts was suing a company called Town Fair Tires which, of course, is a tire store which has a number of stores throughout the Northeast. Some of their stores are in Massachusetts and some of their stores are in New Hampshire. New Hampshire has no sales tax. Massachusetts has a 6.25% sales tax. So people from Massachusetts were going to New Hampshire, supposedly, this is what the Department of Revenue was claiming, buying tires in New Hampshire and then bringing them back to use in Massachusetts without paying the use tax. So they turned around, they sued Town Fair Tires and said, you guys should be collecting sales tax because you have locations in Massachusetts, which in legalese is known as a physical nexus. You have some locations in our state. Well, luckily the Supreme Court threw that out. Under the Marketplace Fairness Act, they wouldn't. The reason for that is if someone would care to take a look at what the Marketplace Fairness Act actually says and you were to scan it for the terms internet or online, you will not find them. They are defined as remote sellers. This is not aimed at the internet. This is aimed at, aimed at any seller in another state. Now can you imagine that the nightmare that a retailer like Town Fair Tires would go through because they would have to ID everybody that came into their store to know where they were from to collect the appropriate sales tax. And can you imagine the risk to our privacy? Well, everywhere we go at the retail level, we have to produce a driver's license so that they can comply with it? It's ridiculous. The internet sales tax is not going to level the playing field. What it is going to do, it is going to put crushing compliance costs on small businesses, and it is going to hinder the growth of one of the few bright spots in our otherwise more abundant economy, online retail. Excuse me. But even worse, it undermines our political system in many ways. It undermines our system of federalism. Tennessee Senator Lamar Alexander recently wrote an op-ed in which he said that an internet sales tax 
would now allow the states to collect taxes which are due them without going to the federal government to ask for permission. In his words, no more mother may I. It's all about states' rights. Well, <laughs> what it would do, it was a dramatically undermine states' rights. Because if I'm a citizen in Tennessee and I have a business, an internet sales tax would make me beholden to tax collectors in another state. If I'm a business in Tennessee, I would now be the subject of politicians in a state like California where I have no ability to influence their policy because I'm not a citizen of California and I don't live in California, therefore I can't vote in California. The Founding Fathers had a motto for this condition. They called it taxation without representation. And now, 237 years later, we've come full circle and here we are back there again. And finally, the internet sales tax is contrary to the Constitution. Now, I know what you guys are thinking about that one. Wow, Glenn, that's a great news flash. Congress does unconstitutional stuff. Thanks for sharing that one with us like we didn't already know it. <laughs> but the Commerce Clause was actually written to prevent stuff like this. You see, the Commerce Clause did not give Congress the power to control internet commerce. It empowered Congress to regulate internet commerce. And what that means is that states were not supposed to be applying taxes to stuff that was crossing their borders. If nothing else, the United States was supposed to be an enormous free trade zone. But so much for that. But I do think it's great that organizations like Campaign for Liberty are fighting against scams like this fraud called the Marketplace Fairness Act. Even more importantly, people like you, and I am so appreciative and so grateful that there are people like you out there fighting so hard to defend and promote liberty. Thank you very much. I recently had the privilege and pleasure of listening to a speech by Judge Napolitano. And one of the things that he said really resonated with me. He said that throughout history, certain generations are called upon to defend liberty. Ours is one such generation. And I thank you very much for allowing me to stand with you. Thank you for your time.